Hey everybody, this is the Life Group Lesson for Sunday, September the 18th, 2022. We are in the book of Amos. Today we'll be in chapter 5, and the lesson is entitled, Seek God. I have my journal here with me today, and I want to share with you about five things that we can take away from this passage. Before we begin, let me open us with a word of prayer. Father, as we look at today's passage... Help us to seek you and to seek out your will for our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The first thing we want to see in today's passage is that we must choose to seek God. Let's look at Amos chapter 5, verses 4 through 7. For the Lord says to the house of Israel, Seek me and live. Do not seek Bethel or go to Gilgal or journey to Beersheba, for Gilgal will certainly go into exile, and Bethel will come to nothing. Seek the Lord and live, or he will spread like fire throughout the house of Joseph. It will consume everything with no one at Bethel to extinguish it. Those who turn justice into wormwood also throw righteousness to the ground. Amos here is calling people to seek God rather than to participate in idolatry. This comes as an invitation from God himself. He's saying, seek me and live. And whenever this phrase is used in the Old Testament, it has one of several meanings. It could describe a prophetic consultation with the Lord, such as in Chronicles, it can also describe a turning to the Lord in repentance and in faith, such as in Deuteronomy. And finally, to seek the Lord could also mean to visit him in his temple at Jerusalem. All of these meanings, though, reflect ways that Israel needed to seek the Lord. Amos describes their worship as turning justice to wormwood. Wormwood is a bitter plant, and by worshiping with impure lives at false altars, the people had changed sweet justice into bitter injustice. God desires worship on his terms from lives that are totally surrendered to him. The second thing we want to see in today's passage is that we must choose to trust in God's power. Let's look at verses 8 and 9. The one who made the Pleiades and Orion, who turns darkness into dawn and darkens day into night, who summons the water of the sea and pours it out over the surface of the earth, the Lord is his name. He brings destruction on the strong, and it falls on the fortress. So God is not a localized deity present only in the temple in Jerusalem. Amos is identifying him as the one who made the constellations. These are two well-known constellations that he mentions here. The God the Israelites needed to seek was in charge of all of the heavens. Baal worshipers thought Baal sent rain, but it was God who turns deep darkness into morning and darkens the day into night and calls for the waters of the sea and pours them out on the surface of the earth. The Lord, not Baal, is his name. Amos declares that God makes destruction on those who think themselves to be strong. Even the strongest people are not immune to the judgment of God. Neither is the fortress strong enough to withstand God's judgment. Israel might have considered themselves stronger than Judah, and they were politically and economically stronger at certain times, but they were not strong in comparison to God. A third thing we want to see in today's passage is that we need to expect God to take action. Let's look at verses 10 and 11. They hate the one who convicts the guilty at the city gate, and they despise the one who speaks with integrity. Therefore, because you trample on the poor and exact a grain tax from him, you will never live in the house of cut stone you have built. 
you will never drink the wine from the lush vineyards you have planted. This refusal to seek God not only manifested itself in the wrong places the Israelites went to worship, but also in their lack of character. Their lives at the altar were polluted by their lives at the city gate. And the gate is a reference to their business transaction. The justice of the Israelites was seen as a perversion in their attitude towards God who speaks the truth. And they loved also to trample on the poor by collecting a grain tax. The word trample here can be used on one who levies taxes, indicating that they were targeting the poor with the taxes they couldn't afford. And because Israel refused to care for the poor in their society, God would take action against them. He basically is going to cause them not to dwell in their houses of cut stone. The Israelites were using their oppression of the poor to build grand homes. But because their nation was going to be going into exile at the hands of the Assyrians, they would never live in these houses. The Israelites had also planted pleasant vineyards, but they would never see the fruit. Basically, a payday for all of our sins will arrive, just like it arrived for Israel. The fourth thing we want to see in today's passage is that we need to expect God to pass judgment. Let's look at verses 12 through 13. For I know your crimes are many and your sins innumerable. They oppress the righteous take a bribe, and deprive the poor of justice at the city gates. Therefore, those who have insight will keep silent at such a time, for the days are evil. The sins of Israel listed are great. Now, Amos doesn't list all the sins, but he does refer to three representative sins of the nation. First, they afflict the righteous. To afflict someone is to cause distress in their lives by hindering them or impeding them. Second, they took a bribe. By referring to the poor as righteous, Amos is indicating that they were innocent of the crime, but the Israelites accepted a bribe to convict the poor of a crime. And third, they deprived needy in the gate. They deprived them of the opportunity to have their plea heard and tried for justice. Because the poor could not have their day in court, they were silenced by their oppressors. God is going to turn the tables on the Israelites when it was their turn for their day in court. The prudent who had insight into what was taking place would be silent under the judgment of God. They would sit in silence as God exacts his judgment on them. They would be unable to defend themselves, just like the poor were currently unable to defend themselves. By telling them this, God is exacting his justice against them. And a final thing we want to see in today's passage is that we need to love good and uphold justice. Let's look at the final verses, 14 and 15. Pursue good and not evil so that you may live, and the Lord, the God of armies, will be with you as you have claimed. Hate evil and love good. Establish justice at the city gate. Perhaps the Lord, the God of armies, will be gracious to the remnant of Joseph. True repentance is always accompanied by some type of action, and Amos calls the people of Israel to seek good and not evil. To seek the Lord in verse 4 also reminds us to seek good in verse 14. God sought a remnant of the people to still follow him, and they would not be able to do so until they have addressed the oppression of the poor. Israel claimed that the Lord, the God of hosts, was with them, but that was a false claim as long as they continued to walk in disobedience to him. The Israelites were religious, but their worship was misdirected and their lives were ungodly. True religion is more than just a ritual. 
It is about a relationship that we have with God. If the Israelites would repent and turn from their sin, then God would be gracious to them. The use of the words, may it be, is a reminder that God's grace cannot be earned, bought, or bartered. It is the sovereign act of God alone who shows mercy on those he desires. We can't bargain for his grace, and we can't buy it. We simply must repent of our sin and trust him. If this nation was willing to confront its own sin, God would perhaps spare a remnant of Joseph. A remnant is a portion rather than the whole. God's judgment was coming on Israel in 722 BC with the invasion of Assyria. Amos holds out the hope that some would avoid that wrath by turning from their evil ways and throwing themselves upon the mercy and the grace of God. Those who loved good and upheld justice would indicate that they were sincere in seeking God and therefore they would live. As we conclude today, there's several things we can take away from this passage to apply. The first is that there is no substitute for God, so we need to seek Him and Him alone. Also, God will discipline His people. And finally, true repentance is accompanied by true actions in our lives. Thank you for joining me for today's session. I will see you in our next study.